But let's let's jump in and talk about immigration because this is a topic that's in the news. It's a campaign issue, uh, of course, a heated one, um, and we have the fascinating candor of J.D. Vance, um, which uh, in the debate Tim Walls did not really point out. He tried, but his words got too garbled. Actually saying he would tell a fault, essentially saying he would tell a false story if it advanced his campaign's narrative of the problem. But my problem with uh, the whole issue of immigration in this country, especially in the campaign, but in general, isn't whose narrative is what, or, you know, obviously the inhumanity of our border policies is awful, um, but the Democrats aren't really offering an alternative vision. I mean, they built hundreds of miles of a wall uh, you know, Trump talks about a, a beautiful wall. Well, the Democrats have built their own share of it. And, and now Kamala Harris is echoing uh, um, uh, Donald Trump's rhetoric about toughening up at the border. Uh, I think immigration numbers have slowed down actually considerably. But at one point, you know, substantial numbers of people were coming into this country. But the real narrative is that, which I don't think either party has challenged uh, in a meaningful way, is that immigrants into this country, uh, for Republicans, they're quote unquote, the problem. They're the reason why you don't have a job or why your job doesn't pay more or why inflation is bad or why you think crime is up, whether or not it actually is, why your cat went missing, you know, whatever it might be, you know, openly racist when it gets into petty eating rhetoric, but, but uh, the Democrats, uh, for their part, tend to say, well, it's a problem, but it, you know, we should be polite about how we handle it. Uh, but I'd like to start with this, uh, putting all that aside, I'm not even sure it's a problem, and I am sure it's not the problem, but I wanted to get your, your biggest picture thoughts 50,000 feet or whatever people say uh, about immigration as it relates to the United States, but in the broadest context. You up for that? Absolutely. Um, I should admit in, in the interest of, uh, how do they say it these days? In the interest of transparency, that uh, both of my parents were immigrants to the United States. Neither of them was born here. Uh, I was. I was born in Ohio, but I'm very close to immigrants, and I have no doubt that that colors my um, take on this. I find myself totally opposed to what Mr. Trump is doing, and as you quite correctly put it, the mild Me Tooism uh, that comes mostly from. Uh, Kamala Harris. Um, and let me tell you why. First, and re really important, I think that the Democrats are missing a uh, fantastic opportunity to smash the Republicans on this issue. If I were advising Kamala Harris, I am not, but if I were I would say, go right after them. This is a mistake they have made. Clothe yourself in Judeo-Christian morality. Uh, the um, Mary and Joseph were immigrants of a, of a kind in that manger also. Um, and we're kind of glad, at least those folks are, who are Christians, um, that they were able to survive and not be treated horribly uh, at the border. Um, the, the, the morality of it is obvious. I won't dwell on it. I want to dwell on why it is not only moral and ethical to welcome, welcome immigrants, but I want to go through the reasons why. Number one, the United States' population is becoming older and its birth rate, a birth a rate of birth is shrinking. We are not reproducing ourselves. 
and that weakens our society and our economy and is very costly because the shrinking number of young people working has to support a growing number of old people in retirement who are not working. This is not a sustainable arrangement unless you tax those at the lower end a lot more to fund the social security that has to go to the increasing number of the old ones. Immigrants are overwhelmingly young, working age human beings. And what they mostly want, and we know that because of that's what they mostly do, is go to work when they arrive here. They want a job. They want a steady job, which means a steady contribution into the Social Security system of the United States. So they are not only not a burden, they are helping to address a very serious problem. Number two, the United States, at least since the Monroe Doctrine of 1830, so we're talking now a two-century insistence that the United States is the dominant power in the Western Hemisphere, that the others, mostly in those days the Europeans, um, are to keep out or to be secondary or need our permission or whatever. In other words, we're in charge. Okay, I agree with that. We have been in charge. I would call it a kind of colonialism, but even if you didn't call it that, you know that major decisions about what has happened in Latin America uh, over the last 200 years have been made by and with the heavy influence of the United States. Therefore, major events like migration are partly the result of American policies across the board, policies affecting trade, policies affecting politics, policies affecting the climate, all of which contribute to the very conditions that drive people to leave their home, their religion, their community, their family, go to another country where they don't know any of those things, where they're taking enormous risks in order to create a livable life for their families. Uh, we ought to have some sense of responsibility. It's a little bit like uh, the responsibility we do sometimes take that if we have mobilized a part of the population of a foreign country to assist the United States in administering that country or fighting a war in that country, we feel a responsibility when the war is lost. I'm thinking here, of course, of Vietnam and to a lesser degree of Afghanistan to say we will create a place in the United States for those who have taken risks to work with the U.S. in those countries to be able to come here. The same logic could and should apply in Latin America, which is where most of the influx of residents, uh, immigrants, uh, have come from. Third, the FBI data show that immigrants have lower rates of crime than Native Americans. And the reason for that is no mystery, and everyone should understand it. And it's simple. If you are a Native person and you commit a crime, you are entitled to all the procedures of due process. If you are an immigrant and you commit a crime, you can be thrown out of the country, and you often are. Immigrants know that. No way are they going to go through what they went through to leave their country with all that that means. Go to another one and then commit a petty crime that can not only deprive them of any chance of citizenship, but force them to leave and to go back to the very circumstances from which they fled. This is, that's the reason they don't commit crimes. It's much too dangerous for them 
to do so. Okay? I could go on. Right. But I want right. to shift. I want to shift now beyond writing the uh, list, which is a big list of why we should welcome immigrants, to asking a theoretical but yet also empirical question. Every wave of immigrants, and the United States is famous as being a country uh, that has had one wave of immigrants after another throughout its history. Well, let me change that. Throughout its history, before it ethnically cleansed the local people out of existence here. Those waves occasioned anxiety on the part of people who were already here about their jobs, their housing, their communities, and so on. We know that story. And the way to handle that story, that a Democrat, especially one in the party of Franklin Roosevelt, ought to have thought through, is to say the following. When the nation needs it, we have created full employment. We did it in 1941 when the nation went to war. Okay? We are confronted with a twin crisis, a collapsing birth rate and an immigration wave. This is a good time to commit to full employment plus a housing construction program, and the two of them could be the same program. Right. The unemployed could be put together to build the housing. The way the unemployed were put together to produce the munitions that the other unemployed would use once they put their uniforms on. Okay, if we gave everybody a job who was here, we could then give a job to the immigrants without anyone here fearing loss of job right. or higher rents or any of the other bugaboos that are being suggested flow from immigration. It would make the U.S. government a hero for all the people who need a secure job who are native. It would make the friction between them and the immigrants disappear. It would solve the entire problem and show up the Republicans and the right-wingers for being the amoral, unethical departures from what could be a great American tradition of welcoming and integrating immigrants. If There's a lot Kamala there. Harris, if Kamala Harris said it, my thinking is it would be a better, for her, for her election prospects, a better response than going to the border and talking tough. So let's take some of your points uh, one by one here, Richard Wolf, because I have some thoughts. Over. First of all, in terms of personal relationships to uh, immigrants, three of my four grandparents were immigrants. My mother, I believe, was born in France, making her an immigrant, although she, she would have been an infant. And uh, yet I've never been asked, where are you from? Which mm -hmm. says something about the culture of this country. Uh, in terms of Social Security, you know, your comments made me think, you know, Social Security by law has a dedicated revenue stream for it that comes from people's paychecks, uh, and that revenue stream is reaching a shortfall. One of the conservative Republican senators was lamenting, blaming the problem on, uh, on the right to uh, an abortion. And he made the claim, it seemed extreme to me, that had that right not been granted in Roe versus Wade, there would be 75 million more Americans of working age, <laughs> and therefore we'd be fine. Of course, he didn't then go on to say, so let's invite 75 mil uh, a million immigrants to take their place, which also, again, uh, interesting bias there. Um, but a couple other thoughts. One on the, um, on the demonization of immigrants. A lot of people don't remember this, but during the First World War, the despised foreigners were Germans. And uh, uh, Will under uh, Woodrow Wilson 
They were shutting down German newspapers, German churches, German language schools, you know, a lot, putting spies in there, a lot of what Muslims experienced during the uh, Iraq war and so on. So I like your uh, idea about uh, a different kind of rhetoric. I think it might take more than one campaign to shift it because it's so deeply embedded and I think it might require a whole broader program. But to me, that program could lie partly in what you said, which is guaranteed jobs, full employment, part of it housing, part of a Green New Deal, um, putting people to work, uh, and also in general economic growth. I mean, I haven't seen any good studies in a long time, and I only saw an okay one when Trump was talking about immigration in 2016 that basically suggested that after 20 years, each immigrant offered, you know, provided some modest economic benefit to the country as a whole, but, you know, it didn't look rock solid to me. But the idea that there is growth behind this kind of idea, uh, and also that if outsourced jobs, if jobs that have been sent to the countries we've exploited in Latin America, if those workers come here, then the money they earn will be spent here. And, and that equates, that comes to growth, right? And, and lastly, I guess, uh, I would only say that in line with so many of our discussions, if we trace all these problems back to the root, here's going to be a real shocker for you, Richard Wolf. Capitalism. <laughs> because to do these very reasonable things that would benefit the vast majority of people in this country, virtually every working person in this country, you might have to shift the dynamic, you know, when, uh, you know, people might say, well, what, if there are a billion workers walking around, uh, people can underbid. If you, if you, it, but if you have a program of immigration that includes a guaranteed job at a livable wage, well, that's going to cut into profit margins a little bit. The whole, the society as a whole is going to be better off. Immigrants are going to be buying goods and services and, People in those uh, professions will benefit, housing, construction will benefit, and so on, and so on, and so on. But you have to have a vision of the society, it seems to me, and the economy that transcends uh, the profit-taking motive among those who finance our electoral campaigns. Am I being too cynical? No, you're being exactly correct. And I, I think... Look, if you talk, in my case, I talk from time to time to people who work, for example, with the United States Chamber of Commerce. They are not in favor of anti-immigration. They know that their members need and want to hire immigrant workers, partly because they need the workers, period, and partly because those workers are cheaper, and partly because those workers are very fearful of losing a job because of the, what that might mean given their immigrant status. So they are docile. Um, nasty employers take avail advantage of that, don't pay them because they know particularly if they're undocumented or even if they're documented, but their husband or their wife or their old sick aunt is living with them and she isn't that they don't want any governmental official coming around, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But there's an economic calculus, very well known uh, in, in the literature of the economics of migration that I want to mention now because it, it belongs in the conversation. It's, it's obvious, uh, but it has been jazzed up to be useful for professional economists. So here's how it goes. If you want to have a worker in your society, if you need workers, immigration is the most efficient way to do that. Why? Because all of the sunk costs of a baby being raised for mm. five years while it is completely dependent, then when another 10 or 15 years of not only being dependent in the sense of consuming goods and services uh, to survive, 
but the costs of putting that person through a public education system, learning to, to speak the language, learning to do the arithmetic, learning to read and so on. By the time they're 17, 18, 19 and enter the labor force, you have spent a fortune on them. Now, if they're native, now consider an immigrant, even an immigrant who comes from a poor country. Those expenses have been carried by that poor country. If that poor country trained that young person until he or she or they were old enough to do the dangerous trek up through Mexico and, and come across the border into the United States as a 19 or 20 year old, which many of them are, you have an unbelievable subsidy. That's what it's called in the literature. It's a subsidy that goes perversely from the poor country to the rich country because the poor country paid to raise the child up, but then all the productivity of the child is in the United States. The United States gets the fruit of their labor, but the United States didn't have to pay any of the costs of feeding and clothing and housing and educating and medically caring for them. And it's perverse because subsidies like that for development purposes are supposed to go from the rich country to the poor one, but the irony is mm -hmm. it goes the other way and migration makes that happen. And yet in America, you never hear from any leading, well, I shouldn't go that far, but I have never heard from a leading Republican or Democrat an argument in favor of the enormous benefits coming to the United States when you have millions of working age people who thereby have loaded the cost of their education onto the poor country they've left in order to bring their most productive years to the United States. That reminds me of a, a, a concept that had some currency in 2016 when I was working for Bernie Sanders and I, I ran afoul of its adherence, even though I'm not necessarily opposed to it, uh, which is the concept of open borders. Um, and here's a case where I think context is everything and the open borders adherence who are sort of a mixture of left and right, uh, of libertarian and, and some kind of left wing, uh, just uh, anybody can come in, right? Anyone, just no borders, no guards, no nothing. You want to come in, you come in. And uh, Ezra Klein of the New York Times uh, kind of sandbagged Bernie on this one in an interview, uh, uh, made it his leading question and pounded him, well, if you like immigration and working people, why aren't you for this? Um, and I wrote a piece about it that basically, as I recall, just said uh, what I just said, context is everything, that if you have an open border policy with a $7.25 minimum wage, which is worth even less now than it was then, um, and, uh, and uh, you know, no lack of uh, employment guarantees or absolute complete lack of employment guarantees and so on it would just you know screw the workers of the united states way you know offer this uh, flood of cheap labor and if people come in and don't obtain id they can be paid less than minimum wage and so on you know i saw a lot of practical problems with it but uh, again coming back to the system we live under but is there a system or a vision where something like open borders could actually work, you think? Yeah, I think it absolutely could. It, it's a question of the commitment you want to make. If I'm right, and I believe I am, that the economic benefit is greater to the country to which the migrant goes, than most people have understood, then it is in the interests of the United States to facilitate that. At this point, if you open the border, my guess is you'd have a pretty hefty movement into the United States. 
But as people who take it seriously, the open border argument have shown, border movements go in multiple directions. Right. Uh, when conditions change, uh, so does the uh, immigration. Europe, which has open borders to an extent among the countries in the EU, et cetera, et cetera, uh, gives us many examples of this uh, of this sort of thing. The French story, which I know, um, is a variation on the American. The way the French work it, and I'm not advocating this, but the way the French work it is when the economy is booming and they're short of labor and wages are going up, they allow large numbers of North Africans and, and now also South Africans to come into the country. And when the economy doesn't grow, they push them back out. And so what you have is actually a moving migration in one direction or the other. And even in the United States, we've had a significant amount of out-migration of people from Central America going back to Central America when they've lost their jobs, when jobs have become uh, difficult to obtain in recessions and so on. So there's evidence, and the same is true, uh, evidence of Puerto Rico, where there is an open border in effect between the Puerto Rican uh, people on the island and the mainland here. They can move freely they do not have a customs uh, or a duty or a passport to show or anything else. It's part of the United States. It's part of the United States. Yeah. So it's an open border in that in, in precisely that sense. And I you know, and we've absorbed so-called absorbed the Puerto Rican immigration uh, perfectly well. There were glitches, there were frictions uh, that that's normal. but it, it it's not some crisis even though the numbers are in the millions of people who left uh, Puerto Rico and came to this country, if you take the whole sweep of the last half century. Uh, and, and so I think there's plenty of, of ways you could accommodate this kind of uh, situation. And my guess is, RJ, I really mean this, that this we're having an argument which is going to be resolved by concrete history. As the birth rate continues to go down, and as the, 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 the crunch on the American political system and the economic system that follows from that, they're going to have to do something. Now, it may be that they're, they're worried that if they let a lot of people in, and if you have half the hyped revolution of artificial intelligence that people talk about, that there will be a surplus of people here uh, on a scale we have not seen before, and that that will create all kinds of social conflict, of which the native versus immigrant will only be a, a, a subordinate story, but one that will make everything worse. That's another uh, feature here uh, that is playing in and has its role to play separate from the from the political use being made of it, or from the racism that is always lurking around it uh, anyway. It's not an accident that the people who were accused of eating pets are dark-skinned. I mean, it's, it's of just- Of course, yeah. And, you know, I'm glad you brought up AI, because we don't really know how major or minor the impact is going to be, but it's likely to have some, you know, pretty significant impact. And as you, may know, I wrote an article for Current Affairs arguing that it should be uh, owned and, and uh, managed uh, and guided socialistically because it's inherently ethically, morally, uh, structurally a so socialistic technology. It's everybody contributes to it. Everybody provides the raw material for it. And uh, I talked about different ways that could be actualize i didn't really go into detail on that part of it but but uh one of the ways might be any gdp growth Absolutely. that's produced by ai you know however you want to structure it that uh, you know but uh the revenue the profits whatever 
taxed at 100 percent, used to enhance the social contract so we know that anybody who's here gets housing, gets their basic needs met, has a job, uh, whatever that job may be, uh, maybe for two hours a week at full-time pay like George Jetson in the Jetsons, but, uh, but they, they work and they, they have, have a fulfilling life. It seems to me, uh, you know, that kind of vision, by the way, uh, I did a lot of research, I've done a lot of research on this, that kind of vision was much more commonplace in the 1960s in this country than it is now. There was yep. serious discussion about this, as you know, in academia and politics and think tanks uh, uh, that, you know, the leisure crisis, uh, David Reisman called it, you know. Um, so we have the intellectual know-how. Uh, we could potentially have uh, the GDP growth to fund it, commensurate with any new uh, population we might acquire through immigration and um you know future crises we can address them if they arise what do you think no i mean i i think it's a wonderful way to introduce socialism here in the united states yeah. I mean, it's, a, it's a wonderful idea it, it, look it, it's about planning it's about saying that our priority is to incorporate the benefits of a new technology incorporate the benefits, if you like, of immigration without damaging people. And, and that requires planning. You have to, you have to plan. You, you can't say in, to the private sector, you install AI when you want to, and you fire X percent of your labor force and go about your business as if there's no agency, not you, not the society, not the government, who takes charge. We don't want you to fire those people. That destroys their morale. That puts, and we know from every statistic there is, that if you unemploy people, you increase their physical illness, their mental illness, their turn to drugs, their alcoholism, their their wife abuse, their husband abuse, their child abuse. I mean, come on. The social ills that flow from unemployment are humongous, and the costs of them equally so. So it is irrational simply to incur them. And why? To secure private profit? That's not that's not worth it. That's a bad bargain. Let's forgo the private profit and make sure that we do the humane cost minimizing thing, which is to guarantee incomes and to guarantee the replacement of every worker who is found to be redundant. Let us have a system in every workplace. If we need fewer positions, what is the system that allows those, for example, who are older to have a, a priority than those who are younger? Or those who have more dependents have a priority over those who have fewer? In other words, a whole system of planned adjustment. Then we get the benefit of AI without paying the absurd cost that is otherwise lurking. All of this anxiety about what AI is going to do has a premise that there is no program of planned job maintenance. If there were, we wouldn't be worried about it. It would be a non-issue. It's like saying in a community, we're worried that nobody has a public park. No one can get out of the house and have a picnic on the lawn. No one has a lawn. Okay, we're going to create Central Park right in the middle of town. We knock down all the buildings and we have grass and flowers and animals and ponds. You know, problem solved. Everybody can go to the picnic. This, this is not difficult. And if we had a voice that said it, whether it's on immigration or on AI, and I'm noticing the parallels as I talk, I think these would be very popular positions politically. 
for people to engage and think about. Even for one of the major parties, if they lost just a bit of their mountain of timidity. And uh, I would summarize that all, Richard Wolf, with the phrase that popped into my head was a future without fear, which yeah. which we can have, but we have to plan, prepare for it in order to avoid that fear. So as always, Richard Wolf, host of Economic Update, and so much more. As always, thanks for your thoughts, and as always, thanks for coming on the program. And thank you. I, when we started, I didn't realize we'd end up with a, a bit of a cheerleading for socialism, but I'm very happy that we did. Well, how unexpected, given two yeah. guys like this. We depend on your support here at the Zero Hour, so please give whatever you can at any of the links you see on your screen. Thanks so much.